for service with difficult asthma or severe asthma. There are several mechanisms or pathways by which uh, you would receive a patient like this, or I would receive a patient like this. And essentially, we're looking at GPs or referral pathways, your own emergency unit, other specialists, or a patient from your own pool who has become unstable. At the outset, I can tell you that there are three pathways for which this patient will leave your service. Either they will have no asthma and they will have some other condition. They will have severe medical disease, which is less than 5% of the population. Or they will have difficult to treat asthma, which is slightly difficult, where other factors other than their medical condition impede the achievement of control. Now, the nuts and bolts definition of asthma is really a heterogeneous disease with chronic airway inflammation that's defined by a pattern of respiratory symptoms, wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough that vary over time and intensity, all tied together with this variable expiratory airflow limitation. Now, what has changed in the last 20 years and it's been the defining concept of modern asthma treatment is that rather than having asthma or no asthma, one can have asthma and be controlled or uncontrolled. So rather than a binary outcome, there is variable control over time. And there's a lovely um, pocket guide that I can direct you guys towards. It's called the GINA Pocket Guide. It's regularly updated. And there was an update in 2019. And it has this pretty of how one can assess control or, un or lack of control. And it is in the uncontrolled group of patients that the risk of acute severe exacerbations is increased. Now, why am I talking about this condition to a group of ENT doctors? So the question is first, will you see this condition? Undoubtedly. The trajectory in sub-Saharan Africa has been very steep, steep upward trajectory. And we know this from prevalence studies all the way from 1995 onwards with regular cross-sectional assessments. And I'll direct you again to the Isaac studies, which is a group, an enormous group of, of collaborators, an enormous body of publications that have provided us with data from sub-Saharan Africa. If you are facility-based or in a referral center, not only will you see patients with asthma, you'll see the severe spectrum with comorbid disease who require multidisciplinary team assessment. What we know from Cape Town, and we know this from a recent publication by Bart et al. in 20, 2021, that the Cape Town pattern has shown sharp increases in prevalence from 1995 until 2002, which now may have plateaued with lifetime prevalences as high as 34.5% in adolescents in Cape Town and current disease as high as 21.3%. That is one in five every adolescent in our city. So will you see acute severe asthma? Absolutely. Is it important? Now, this is also a different question. How are you going to judge important? Is it prevalence data that's important? Is it admission data? Is it disability adjusted life years? Life years. We all can agree that mortality is important. And this is again from the Global Burden of, of Asthma, which was published in 2018 which shows us where we stand in terms of mortality. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all the colleagues who've worked tirelessly over the years to move us from the dark green, dark blue bar, which was extremely poor, to the light blue bar, which you can also agree is not that good. We are among the highest um, levels of, of asthma mortality across the world. Now, asthma mortality all ages, one can say perhaps it's comorbidity, perhaps they have COPD, perhaps they have other issues. But if you look at our mortality from ages five to 34, I think we can all agree that this is a group that should never be dying of their asthma and we can certainly do better for them. Now, why this audience? There are several conditions that mimic acute severe asthma that may present to your service or that may require your intervention. Incorrect diagnosis can add to morbidity and mortality, but also to an ever escalating medication regimen with side effects. And here I speak mostly about oral steroids. 
many of the step up drugs that are available internationally are not readily available in South Africa. And when one has frequent exacerbations or one has a severe patient, one has to bring in oral steroids, which we know have long term effects that really need to be monitored very closely. So there are many of these asthma comorbidities that can present to you. We have patients with foreign bodies. We have patients with reflux. There's the overlap of obesity and obstructive sleep um, apnea. We have patients with cystic fibrosis or ciliary dyskinesia who can all sneak into an ENT clinic by a variety of manners. But many of these conditions, the ones with the asthma, can coexist with asthma, and all of them are comorbidities that independently or collectively can negatively affect asthma outcomes. What are the challenges when one looks at pediatric acute severe asthma? It's a heterogeneous practice. Almost every facility would have a slight difference in how they manage their patients. The evidence base, unfortunately, is not robust. Poor outcomes, we know, are most often related to underassessment in the little ones because they are difficult to assess objectively, and in the older asthmatics as well. We are really, if ever, able to perform bedside, bedside lung punch tests in the PEDS Emergency Center, which is one of the few objective measures that we have of, of airflow limitation. What I can say is that Metro West of the Metro Health System, which is where Red Cross falls into, has benefited greatly from a standardized approach to acute severe asthma. We know that from internal quality assurance work that we've done. Mortality has decreased, PICU admissions have decreased, and intubation rates have de decreased. I have included just briefly for your interest a little guideline on what are the indications for PICU, man PICU admission, and they are things like cyanosis, arising CO2, minimal chest movement or silent chest, marked respiratory distress, and a decreasing mental state and lethargy or agitation. Cardiorespiratory arrest is what, something that one does not ever wish to see, and it's an obvious indication for resuscitation and, and ICU admission. We can do nothing in the year 2021 without talking about COVID. And I also include for your interest, the acute severe asthma protocol that Professor Levine has modified for the Metro, which has changed very slightly, only in that we are avoiding um, nebulization under any circumstances except acute life-threatening asthma. We've managed mild, moderate, and severe asthma with a multi-dose regimen via a subutamol MDI. And I must say that this, in the year that we have been doing this, that we've actually managed very well. This is also a slide that I'm not going to dwell in at all, other than to show you the range of differential diagnoses that exist for asthma at different ages. But for us, for this morning, we will be speaking, spending more time speaking about vocal cord dysfunction. This is an interesting diagnosis. It's a condition that's been, that's existed for a long time, but increasingly being, being recognized since roughly the 1980s. It's had a variety of names over the years, and it is a paradoxical adduction of the vocal cords and inspiration, which causes dyspnea, cough, wheeze or stridor. Now many of these words, dyspnea, coughs, wheeze, are the same words that we use when we spoke about asthma. And you can see how these two conditions can be completed or can mimic each other. And in fact, unfortunately, can coexist in each other. It is characterized by having a sudden onset with difficulty of inspiration rather than expiration, of having a level of distress that is discordant with the degree of clinical hype inflation you will find if you examine these patients, or drop in lung functions that one would find if one was able to do so during the acute attack. The wheeze that is noted in um, vocal cord dysfunction, the literature assures me is locatable in a specific area and in the neck in the cervical area. You will appreciate that in pediatrics, this type of clinical distinction is very difficult to find. There are many presentations of how vocal cord dysfunction can present, but and they tend to be discipline specific. I will see predominantly the dyspnea or chronic cough, and perhaps you will see more the dysphonia of swallowing difficulties. 
There are many subtypes of vocal cord dysfunction. They can be those who originate spontaneously with exercise or other irritants, and there's definitely a psychogenic overlay. Within the diagnostic criteria, traditionally there has been laryngoscopy, which has been the gold standard. And certainly for myself, that is the one that I am most familiar with and that I'm most familiar hearing about. The field has progressed significantly though. There are many centers that are now using imaging, which is dynamic imaging techniques, where they look at the diameter of the larynx and compare that to the trachea and use diagnostic algorithms to diagnose vocal cord dysfunction. There are many provocation um, uh, protocols, which can be using either exercise or metacholine as the, as the, as the as the challenge medium, which is followed by an observational period, which can either be using spirometry or um, very interesting techniques where you use continuous laryngoscopy combined with an exercise challenge to diagnose vocal cord dysfunction. And these would be more um, in, in, the, in the large ENT services. I, I mention again that it's really important to have clinical clarity as to what condition you are talking about because vocal cord dysfunction clearly can mimic asthma or it can coexist in patients who do have asthma. There have been recent attempts to bring um, to, to have umbrella terms which cover all of these subtypes and all of the different ways in which vocal cord dysfunction can present. And there's the term inducible laryngeal obstruction which was which has come which came out in about 20 13 via ERS, but this term in itself has generated some controversy. What is the prevalence of this condition in the general population? That is something that I will not be able to tell you. There is great discordance in the literature and the prevalence rates that are presented from the low teens, 10, 12%, up into the high 30s. Most of the work that's been done has been in selected populations, in referral populations, in tertiary clinics. And it's quite difficult to kind of gauge what the, 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 the global population is. There is a postal study in, a, in, a, in Luxembourg in a, with, that's been a subset of a greater uh, population study that estimated a 4 to 6% of vocal cord dysfunction. But one can imagine that the, that the methodology of a questionnaire for vocal cord dysfunction will have certain logistical issues. But that is, however, the best um, unselected population prevalence that I could find. The pathophysiology equally is difficult to understand. And it's hypothesized to be a result of laryngeal hyperresponsiveness, which is tied to the complex innovation of the larynx, which is very different from the paradigm of asthma, which is chronic inflammation in the lower airway. Vocal cord dysfunction, if you are looking at spirometry, which is the testing modality that I am um, familiar with, has got a characteristic look to it. We start with a normal spirometry pattern on the far left. We move to the typical scooped out um, expiratory loop that we see in asthma, and we move on to VCD, which has a truncated inspiratory loop, which is the classic pattern. This next slide, I am not even going to attempt due to our recent technological failures, but I'm gonna ask Tazir to share this for you, which is um, a clip of um, a patient undergoing laryngoscopy, which Tazir was kind enough to share with me. Tazir, can you play the video? Sure, no, can I do so? Um, I'll stop sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Back over to you, Dr. Naidu.
Thank you so much. In this static image, you can actually see images during laryngoscopy as well, within the same patient, both in inspiration, showing the paradoxical adduction in mid-inspiration in the patient with vocal cord dysfunction. The image on the left, A, is on diagnosis, and image on the right, B, is in the same patient following um, supportive speech therapy. So how are we going to manage this complex condition? Um, and this, 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 can, this is a multidisciplinary team approach. There is no way around that. It's important to remember that diagnosis itself is a, ther is a, is a therapy. Many of these patients will have had a long and very frightening road with their child of these sudden severe attacks that have been labeled often as asthma. And they would have been undergoing multiple emergency room visits, multiple doctor appointments, and living frankly in fear of acute exacerbations. So the diagnosis itself is therapy. And if done correctly, it can allay a lot of concern and anxiety in, in the family. I want to also remind you to reassure and actually to be kind and gentle to these families. There's an overlay around vocal cord dysfunction that we bring with us from the past that is quite negative in terms of its psychogenic overlay. Um, there's an early paper from Christopher et al. who described it as one of the conversion disorders, but there are many papers from before that that, call, that will talk about hysterical stridor or Munchausen stridor, which has a very negative outlay overlay. So it's very important when one is speaking to the family to actually be clear that this is a medical condition, that there are psychological triggers, but this is not a, a um, this is not a condition that where, whereby the patient is trying to get gain or assume the sick role. In sub-Saharan Africa and in many communities, it's far, far easier for a child to be ill rather than for a child to be sad or a child to be anxious or a child to be afraid. So it's very important that this diagnosis and reassurance be done well and done correctly. Once you're done with, um, with um, counseling the family, our colleagues in speech and behavioral therapy are very, very important. The techniques that they concentrate on are purse lip breathing or diaph diaphragmatic breathing and are very, very, very effective. And there's a, um, there's a response rate that Petra Fadal uh, described of, be, of being 60 to 70% minimum effective. Medical comorbidities are really important. Um, these patients often have other conditions and they've been shown to have things like asthma, they've been shown to have reflux, they've been shown to have sinusitis and all the other complications that other patients can have. But if you have a patient who has multiple um, conditions, treat the VCD first. It is the one that has an, has an achievable good outcome. The treatment is, most of us have, have really access to speech therapists, and it's also a non-pharmacological um, way of treating a patient. These multimodal patients often on complex polypharmacy uh, regimens, which is the absolute mortal enemy of adherence. We all know this. The more therapies the patient has, the less they actually take of it. VCD is an, an avenue that one has for non-pharmacological treatment with very good results. So if you have a patient with multiple com comorbidities, focus on the VCD. Triggers are also important. Exercise is one of the major triggers and you'll find particularly um, in the adolescent group, particularly in, 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 in young women, and often in young women athletes, that exercise might be a trigger for vocal cord dysfunction symptoms. In these patients, identification of the trigger may be easy, but managing that trigger may not be ideal. If one is an elite athlete, one would not want to leave one's exercise. And if one is a patient, particularly with asthma, particularly with an overlay of an increased BMI or frank obesity, then again, decreasing exercise is something that would one, one would want to manage rather than um, remove. Psychological treatment is, and the literature does not go into great detail about this as to which techniques are, are preferable, and it is and it, left to be implied that it's kind of behavioral therapy that is, um, that is preferred. 
In terms of the more ENT specific conditions, I speak with no personal experience whatsoever, but there are a variety of techniques that one finds in the literature, ranging from botulinum toxin injections to resection techniques. My, my review of this is they seem to be small groups of, of patients, um, small series is not randomized and the quality of the evidence here is not robust. So what is the workup for a patient with VCD? So now we are looking at the basics, detailed history, systemic examinations, symptom diaries and questionnaires. These are really essential. Recall bias is very important when one is trying to get an idea of what the symptoms are. A specific atopic history of other clinic symptoms beyond asthma, we would look at things like eczema, rhinitis, food allergy, for example, and investigation if possible. When I say investigation, I don't mean complex serological testing, and skin prick testing is the kind of a baseline um, screening investigation that would be fantastic. Home peak flow monitoring, if possible, is really good. It can reveal a diurnal variation, which is strongly suggestive of asthma, or it can show you preserved lung functions, even while the patient is within what looks like an exacerbation. Lung functions are wonderful. I've showed you the pictures of the classic um, spirometry findings of asthma and BCD, and measures of airway inflammation, such as exhaled nitric oxide, if possible, can support your diagnosis of airway inflammation. Now, it's very early on a Friday morning, and I'm not completely awake, but surely you are starting to be a little bit suspicious now because isn't that what the P's rage does? Now, I know that many of you will be reaching for the referral. I've got the little picture on the, on the right of the pinky, which is how you write up the referral to another speciality. But colleagues, wait. Before you write out that pinky, I want to introduce you to Baxa et al. who is our group from, from Melbourne, Australia, who've actually changed the way they manage their patients with vocal cord dysfunction. They gather up together in a single room, a group of people. They have pediatricians, they have ENT surgeons, they have speech therapists, they have parents and children. They, they had a group of 80 patients in total, which was a fantastic little study. They took a detailed history, respiratory and general. They administer an asthma control test, which is a symptom uh, based assessment of asthma, which focuses on control or not control. And they did an in-clinic laryngoscopy. And together by consensus, patients were allocated to a diagnosis. Of these 80 patients, 16 had asthma alone, and the rest had some variety of vocal cord dysfunction. Roughly two thirds of these patients had supportive speech therapy alone, and one third had supportive speech therapy, plus some other additional um, treatment methodology but I would like to draw your attention to the outcomes that they had. Their GP visits and EC visits plummeted. Um, GP visits for the speech therapy group alone went from 10.1 10 visits per year on average to five visits per year on average. EC visits half from 4.2 to 2.4. And this was just with reassurance, consensus diagnosis, and their speech therapy. Now, this is a fantastic result for anyone, but for a resource strapped um, health system such as we work in, this is an enormous saving to the healthcare system, enormous. Now, again, I know what you would be thinking. It's very nice to do these things in Australia where one has lots of resources. I'm sure they have thousands of pediatricians and thousands of ENT surgeons. And I'm sure it's too difficult for us. And I'm sure we can't afford it. And I'm sure there's many reasons why we can't do it. But I actually want to show you the cost of acute severe asthma. This slide is the GINA treatment guidelines. And while step one and step two of low dose inhaled corticosteroids are very easy to accomplish, as one goes through from step three to step four to step five, the cost of investigation and management and treating these patients increase exponentially. I don't, I'm not even sure if the biologicals are on these, um, is on the slide, but anti-IgE is roughly 10,000 rand a, a dose. So these are not cheap patients to manage. And I can tell you from my personal 
practice, the burden of acute severe asthma is crippling to the healthcare system, crippling. We have to manage these patients in terms of emergency medicine. We have to bring them to hospital. We have to manage the easy bits, non-invasive. We have consumables. There's inpatient care. There's income loss to the family. If even 5% of these severe asthmatic are proven not to be asthmatic, are proven to have another diagnosis which doesn't need to be treated in this way. The savings that we can that we can find are enormous. And I really would encourage us to think about the multidisciplinary approach to managing these patients and to see the benefit where we can. I would not be able to let you leave this meeting without speaking about post-traumatic disorder and mood disorders. They would confiscate my pediatric card if I did that. Anxiety, mood disorders, post-traumatic disorder are very common in South African children. We have an enormous rate of, of interpersonal violence and societal violence that patients are exposed to. The manifestations include symptoms like tachypnea, dyspnea, intense anxiety around their dyspnea. And again, you see the overlay of the symptoms that we have found both in vocal cord dysfunction and in asthma. The history can be occult. Spirometry can be very useful if one does not find bronchial hyperreactivity. But I will remind you that the asthmatic who has new psychosocial triggers will still have bronchodilator, will still have bronchial hyperreactivity. Also in a family that has a dysfunctional carer, that is an independent risk factor for PICU admission in acute severe asthmatic. In interest of time, I think I'm gonna skip the spirometry. And I'm going to go to the outcome of our, of our initial referral. As I indicated, severe asthma is a tiny proportion. We might have patients who are not asthmatic and who require a different management pathway, and BCD is a likely suspect. And we will probably be left with non-severe asthma that is difficult to treat. Now, difficult to treat is a real, it's, it's very, very real. These patients need asthma education and they need re-education, and they need re-education again and again and again in what feels like a never-ending pattern. One has to optimize adherence and verify where possible. Check scripts, ask about refills, ask about old meds at home. You need to evaluate inhaler technique. You must see this with your own eyes. You cannot believe the kinds of things patients can do with their inhalers other than use it correctly. You need to look at the home environment with some detail Irritants, pollutants, allergens, new pets, renovations, home businesses that, are, that have started. And you need to have a look at the psychosocial milieu of the child. Unfortunately, difficult asthma is really severe asthma. Unfortunately, it will still be likely difficult to manage. More problems can be found outside the chest than inside the chest in most patients. And what we often need rather than sophisticated investigations is to do the basics right with an astute clinician. Thank you so much for having me. My greatest apologies about the um, technological glitches. It was a very well-timed um, request to speak because I'm going to remind you that World Asthma Day is happening very, very shortly. And the theme this year is uncovering asthma misconceptions. And to remind you that under many the label of many asthmatic is actually a child with vocal cord dysfunction. I'm going to pause now for questions and references. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Naidu. Um, actually, this is a disease process, as you've mentioned, that our specialty and your specialty, I'm sure, uh, see quite often and uh, as you've shown, will be quite beneficial to continue this kind of collaboration between departments. Uh, thank you very much. And um, it's really nice to see the kind of um, outcomes that uh, your department is having uh, with the study that you've done and the change of protocols that you've managed um, in the Cape Town Metro. Um, so that was also very nice to see. I'm gonna open um, the discussion to any questions uh, or comments. And, and perhaps we can ask um, uh, Professor Pierre, who is the head of pediatric ENT at Red Cross, to perhaps give some comments. Thanks, Tassir. 
Thanks, Shirani. That was great. I think for me, at least, um, it secures the uh, thinking that we work in a united airway. And we can't ever underplay the fact that um, the chest and the function of the lungs work um, in unity with the larynx and with the supraglottis and even the nasal passages in neonates. So thank you for recognizing the um, sometimes ambiguous presentation with some children who for some reason are being treated for asthma but have uh, refractory um, relief and, and, and we end up seeing them in a far delayed capacity with bilateral vocal cord palsy. And just to put some context to that video, that was a 12 year old girl who actually had um, what we think was an idiopathic um, bilateral vocal cord palsy, but had struggled through the system being treated for asthma. And then at seven years of age had um, um, been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea and was subsequently booked for an adenotonsillectomy and had the surgery and then dramatically deteriorated in recovery. It was still not picked up. It still took about six to eight months before she came in with what was an acute exacerbation of her asthma. And somebody thought to put in a, a flexible scope. And that was when the diagnosis was, was made. So perhaps eight years too late for that child, but thankfully was caught and she is being managed and will subsequently go on to have an laryngotracheoplasty. I think that's what spurred on the uh, need for the meeting. So thank you, Shirani. Um, Shazia, that, that, that's actually such a sad story because, you know, the astute clinician in the EC, if you'd percussed that chest, you would have noticed that she was not that hyperinflated. Um, and it's the astute clinician who sees at the start. And, and often we don't speak enough to the doctors in our EC, you know, sometimes they start by juniors, but it's that initial thought of like, wait, something is not right that sparks the, the kind of the mental discourse that requires the person in the scope to come and see, because it's that acute presentation that, that you have to think about. Indeed, you're right. Um, Shazay, Dr. Nadu, I don't know if I can just ask a question. Yeah. Um, thank, thank, thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanted to ask, in that study they did in Australia with 80 patients, surely you in order to make the, the diagnosis, it's obviously it's a multidisciplinary team, but surely you need the patient to be having an acute kind of exacerbation of vocal cord dysfunction to see that um, paradoxical A deduction um, for the scope. So I'm, I suppose I'm just asking how they put the information together and on an outpatient basis. Um, was it sort of just a combination of the spirometry, spirometry, but I suppose that you would also need a degree or level of obstruction pretty acutely to achieve that spirometry curve? This is a referral service and they are very well stocked. So the asthma control test that they that they did, um, it was that would have been the pediatrician that did it and it was five G pediatrician, is very good about determ determining the symptom pattern, the diurnal variation in the trigger pattern. So that was good. They also have an exercise um, one of those, it, it, evidently the acronym is CLE, where you have an exercise, uh, they have a treadmill and they have a d distinct protocol where they can actually do a provocation test. So it was a very long assessment. I didn't put that in, it was about 45 to 65 minutes, where if on initial implanting laryngoscopy, they could not find consensus, they went on to provocation testing. So it was a really quite um, in-depth assessment that they did. And um, it was the consensus of experienced persons who go, this is not quite right. And then they also saw the patients later. So it wasn't just a single visit. It was a little bit of a process because they reviewed them after the speech therapy as well. So some of the VCDs are spontaneous, but others can be induced. And this particular group, if they, they went on to, to, to quite in-depth assess their patient. Louisa, are you asking about the actual investigation or how they got there? Um, I think Dr. Knight has already answered okay. that mostly, right. so, so that's, that's sort of what I was asking. Um, okay. Yeah. It's also a referral clinic. So these are complex patients who've come through the system and there was already an index of suspicion that they might not be a simple asthmatic. So that's also why they, they had a pre- um, they, they were a selected group of, of likely to be VCDs, which is also why they probably had such good results. 
Yeah, I think that that index of suspicion is what gets them into a more specialist space. I know we did flexible scopes with kids on treadmills, I used to do it every week at Sick Kids, uh, just to induce it. So I think it was the suspicion, clinical suspicion that pushed them for further investigation that perhaps we don't have the luxury of an interred cross or I don't know anywhere in the, uh, in the country. Do we have something like that? I don't also, I, I was, I, I found, you know, researching this, this talk to be most enjoyable because the field has moved on in so many ways. The dynamic imaging techniques, um, these exercise protocols, and they really open doors that previously, you know, this is a, this is a common thing. Like if you've got an inducible condition, how do you induce it in a way that is safe for the child and that you can measure objectively? So all of these exercise protocols and, and provocation protocols are really helpful, not just for vocal cord dysfunction, but for other conditions that are inducible. Um, the question is, with what we have, how do we rearrange the resources that we have so that we can offer patients things like that? And in, in the current platform where we, we've diverted so much of our resources towards COVID, and we know that the health systems are going to be so stretched in the years to come. How do we push to increase our diagnostic capacity? Um, and it has to be with the view that we can get benefit, that we can get gain for the system. So I think, Shazia, I'm going to leave that challenge in your capable hands, and then I'm going to ask you, how can you expand to get some kind of provocation testing at Red Cross? Well, um, you know, historically, we used to get the kids to walk up and down the stairs, go and buy some sweets and come back up and see how tired you are. And that was what Chris and uh, Graham used to do. I think what we've moved beyond to now is obviously with aer aerosol generating uh, procedures, we are moving to translaryngeal ultrasound. And I think certainly vocal cord paresis, you need by, as well as the paradoxical function, I think would be a good place to try and do a non-invasive, perhaps not a, you know, something that would provoke an attack, but at least at baseline uh, to see. So I think that's something we can offer with our limited resources, but also to give our trainees um, an extra skill set, especially in a developing world setup and with patients in large centers that don't have access to flexible scopes with or without COVID being um, a confounder. So that's something that we are actively doing now. We just got funding and we got an ultrasound probe that's portable and just got consent. I think we, our ethics was approved about three weeks ago. So that's something we're going to be looking at. And perhaps, perhaps it is a good uh, cohort of patients, the asthma patients, to just do a baseline um, translaryngeal ultrasound on all of them, or at least the refractory ones, if they'll, if they'll you know, lie still enough. That may be something worth looking at, I'm not sure. That's an exciting thought, yeah, definitely. Thanks uh, very much, uh, uh, Shazi and, and uh, Shirani, for those really uh, interesting comments and discussions. Um, one of the pillars of uh, paradoxical vocal cord movement or vocal cord dysfunction is speech therapy and breathing exercises. And I see um, uh, we have uh, uh, Rosalind Lenton, uh, uh, one of the chief uh, speech and language therapists, uh, uh, who's now retired, but is still at Red Cross. Uh, Rosalind, do you want to uh, comment on, on anything uh, on today's topic? Um, hi, Rosalind, are you there? Hi, Jessica, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. You, you know me and technology, so it's, it's a frightening thought, not even my comment. <laughs> so, yeah, Tessia, we when I was at Krutuski Hospital, we had some referrals. They started coming in more and more. In the past, we didn't have, uh, obviously, adults. And I must say, my experience was extremely limited. You know, I, I ran to do some reading. And the, um, I think on, on 
two ladies, we were fairly successful with a technique uh, that I personally had seen, which is, of course, um, a lot of, of um, discussion with the adult. I'm not too sure how one can do this with younger kids. I don't have any experience. Progressive relaxation and, yes, focus on diaphragmatic breathing. And then the exhalation had to be on a voiceless a consonant, a S or F to have a sustained exhalation, keeping the vocal cords open. So I had two successes, and I must say the others were co-occurring. Can you still hear me? We can hear you well, Rosalind. Oh, sorry. The, and the other two were co-occurring with asthma, and I'm afraid we had, I had no success because um, the, the minute they felt an attack coming, they would grab uh, their pump, and you know the the uh, technique was uh, was not uh, performed. So yeah, I, I have very little experience, and that's really my only comment. It did work well with the two, but these were very committed um, ladies with with a lot of insight. So I'm not too sure how this you know um, can be done with the children. Interesting. Thanks very much uh, for those comments, Roslyn, and, and, and glad to see that you had some successes with that kind of uh, therapy. Uh, Dr. Naidu, any uh, comments on, uh, on Roslyn's uh, experience? You know, uh, this, is, uh, this is the problem with pediatrics. Everything is developmental. So there are, there are things that you can achieve at certain ages and with certain techniques. And I think um, with the little ones, you can you can reassure them, you can get them to the idea of play, and you can actually achieve a lot if you have buy-in from the mother. Because if mommy says it's okay, if mommy says, let's do this, let's breathe together, you can actually get quite far if you have a committed uh, parent-child dyad. And Rosalind's brought in a very important question of buy-in. If there's buy-in and insight, then you can go quite far. I think it's the older child and adolescent that one would have a lot more um, leeway with, uh, particularly that group of exercise-induced female athlete and often high-performing athlete and often insightful um, type A personality athlete. So within that group, particularly ages nine, 10 and upwards, the prepubertal and pubertal um, uh, children, I think one could get very far with uh, the supportive environment and a supportive family. I think if you have that, you can progress. But if you don't have buy-in from the family, you don't have insight from the family, you don't have acceptance from the family, then you will get nowhere. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naidu, and thank you very much, Rosalind, as well. Um, what was very interesting, I also found, just as we start closing our discussion, is that the, the element of the psychogenic overlay that you mentioned. Um, uh, by coincidence, just two weeks ago, I saw a patient on call, an 18-year-old female with paradoxical vocal cord uh, movement, and she was a week away from her exams. Um, so I referred her to the speech therapists, and I, I scheduled a follow-up a week after exams finished. And, uh, and lo and behold, uh, on repeat flexible nasal endoscopy a week later, uh, she was stress-free and her vocal cord movements were absolutely normal. Uh, so it's quite interesting on what stressful periods can do to the, to the human body as well. There's a fantastic study in thorax almost 15 years ago where they did spirometry on people um, who had been bereaved, who had recently been divorced, who had been retrenched. Um, it was a wonderful observational study. And the, the amount of change one can see on spirometry in times of intense emotional stress, it made such an indelible impression on in me. I've never, I've never forgotten it. It's, it's years and years ago. But it, they were in a group of asthmatics who were well controlled, who were taking their controllers, who never stopped taking their controllers. But just in those landmark periods of their life, you could watch the way their spirometry dropped and dropped in a sustained fashion. And it was actually, it took quite some time for them to recover emotionally, but also in terms of objective lung functions. It was really, it was a, it was a 
good study too. I was, I was, I was a registrar at the time, but it made such an impression in my mind that I've never actually, it's always been part of my, my clinical questions when I examine, you know, when I have a new consult, it's like, what's going on in your life? Excellent. Uh, well, this is a, a very healthy discussion, Dr. Naidu. Um, I think I don't see any other uh, comments or questions on the chat function. Um, and I don't see any hands raised. Um, so I'll, I think I'll close. Dr. Naidu, any closing comments from your side? No, thank you, Tazir. I apologize, colleagues, for my IT failures. Um, it's, I would like to say uncommon, but actually not. Rosalind and I have that in common. We, we are not good with the IT. No problem at all. No problem at all. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, once again, it really was a privilege of being here. And uh, we will upload your, your talk to our YouTube channel. Uh, and I'll share it with you uh, in the course of the day. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to uh, our audience that's uh, actually from all around the continent for joining us today as well. Thank you. Thanks very much.